Hello, I'm Juliet Mann and this is the Agenda podcast, CGTN Europe's one-stop shop for smart, in-depth discussion of the issues that really matter in the world today. We're now at the end of World Water Week, the world's biggest global water event. The focus has been the value of water for people in development, the financial and economic value of water, and the value of water for nature and climate. The world faces three interconnected planetary crises, climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. And water plays a key role in all of them. The UN reports that by 2030, the world could face a 40% shortfall in water supply if current consumption trends continue. So what technology is being harnessed to change that? Joining me now is world-renowned water expert, Arsit K. Biswas. And Professor, thanks ever so much uh, for coming on the agenda. I want to start by asking you, do you think that the world takes water, water scarcity, seriously enough? We can look two ways at the problem. If you look at the media and the governments, there's a lot of rhetoric about the water scarcity. However, if you look at the political structure, I don't see any sign that water is in a priority item or in their political agenda. And that is the real dichotomy. On the one hand, everybody says what we are facing a water shortage of unprecedented proportions. On the other hand, the politicians are only interested in water when there is a major flood or there is a drought. And the moment the flood disappears, interest in water disappears. So that's what makes World Water Week um, so important to get those conversations going. Talk us through the five drivers of change that World Water Week 2023 is really going to focus on. Um, drivers of change will come not from the, regrettably, not from the World Water Week or the meeting of uh, water professionals, large meetings of water professionals in Stockholm or Singapore or the World Water Forum, which happens every three years. This has basically transformed into uh, what I would call the Woodstock of water. Large number of people go. Uh, discussions are rather mundane, nothing very cutting edge or latest developments. But main advantage of the Stockholm Water Week or the Singapore Water Week or the World Water Forum, these mega events with several thousand participants, is networking and get to know and talk to each other, talk to each other during the event. That is the main advantage I see. I don't see anything coming out substantial from all these types of mega events. So how do you think that cooperation on water, on the environment and climate, can perhaps strengthen peace and stability and get those politicians to the table? Um, there is a disconnect between the discussions of the water profession and uh, policymakers, and that is the real problem. How do we get the, our solutions to the policymakers. Take, take a country like the United States, one of the world's most technologically advanced and economically advanced country. Its Colorado River Basin is having a major problem the last several years. Now, let's look at the problem of the Colorado River Basin. Do we have the knowledge to solve it? My answer is yes, we had the knowledge for a long time. But what is the situation? Well, even for an advanced country like U.S., Colorado Basin, which has seven states of U.S. in the West, the water laws belong to the 19th century. How do we change what we have been doing for ages? How do we, how do we in 21st century, we are entering the second quarter of the 21st century, how do we get the water professionals to ditch the previous paradigms which are no longer working. And one of the things I'm seeing now, most of my water, my colleagues don't understand, if we look at the water management the last 10 years, the country that has made the, has made the most advances really is China. And you won't see very much 
had very much Chinese presence in Stockholm. There will be some, but not very much Chinese presence. And the people who actually are making these differences in China will not be there. Well, I'll just talk about one piece of research, which is aqueduct analysis, which says that by 2050, close to 60% of the world's population could experience extremely high water stress at least one month of the year. By 2050, that number could be closer to 60%. So economic growth, food production, population growth, it's all at risk here, isn't it, without better water management? Uh, I am afraid that assumes, and this is a big assumption, that situation will continue, the trends will continue as it is. Uh, if that is the case, yes, that will be the situation. Now, my forecast is in about 10 years' time, we are going to see some major problems, not because of water shortages, uh, that, will, that will be some problem, but not so serious, but, that, uh, but because of water quality deterioration in much of the world, which will create some major health, major health issues, which will force politicians to sit up and take issues. Now, if, if you're telling me that the prognosis the aqueduct and the others have given is correct, I will give you several examples where those types of situations, uh, linear projections never, never work out. I can assure you that by 2050, things, water situation, in my view, of the world will be much better than what it is at now, primarily because many of the developments that are happening, which will not, which will not be discussed in Stockholm, but in many parts of the world, cumulatively, they will make a tremendous difference. Let me give you just one example. If I ask you which city in the world has the best water supply performance indicators, London, Los Angeles, Paris, or Phnom Penh. I think most people will be surprised to find the performance indicators of Phnom Penh, now water supply, is better than London or Paris or Los Angeles. And if Phnom Penh can do it, a country that is uh, and the early stages of development had catastrophic problems itself. If Phnom Penh can put itself out of bootstraps, why can't the other developing countries do it? You know, perhaps then that's why nature-based systems are quite high on the agenda at World Water Week. Um, there seems to be a revival, too, of traditional knowledge. So how do you think that indigenous perspectives are going to drive innovation? Uh, my view is slightly different. Indigenous knowledge is fine, and many times they do really help. But those knowledge was developed when the world was a very different place. The population was much less, urbanization was much less, economic activities is much less. So the question is, would they be able to solve the world's problem when we have uh, significant increase in population, urbanizations, economic activities, and, uh, and knowledge and uh, information explosion. So that is, that is the issue. Indigenous knowledge has its place, but if you want to solve Delhi's water problem, I regret to say there would be a very, very limited issue, a very, very limited help uh, to s solve Delhi's or Sao Paulo's or, or uh, Cape Town's water problems. So those are the issues. Everything has its place, but to say that they are universal solutions, those, I'm afraid, I don't believe them. Um, and what about partnerships then? I, I, where would you like to see more of the private sector getting involved, perhaps, and what kind of cross-sector collaboration do you think might be beneficial and, and might actually get some traction? Many of the industries now have significantly improved their water use per ton of product. And I'll give you a couple of examples, like an industry like Nestle. Now, there are, Nestle, as you know, produces condensed milk, powdered milk. 
Now, there are several milk factories of Nestle now, at least six, uh, which they have converted now, uh, which using existing technology so that the whole factory does not use any water at all from the nature. Wow. What it does is, what it does is milk contains 84 to 85% of water. Before it was evaporated. Now, once Nestle's made a policy decision that the price of water they're using in any factory in the world would be at the price which is charged to them yes. in Veve, Switzerland, where the headquarter is, or if the price of water is higher in any parts of the world than Veve, that price should be used. Now, when Nestle's factory started using the Veve water prices, they found out it is actually cheaper to install technology to catch the evaporation, uh, condense it, treat it, and use that water for uh, use that water for industrial purposes. Professor Asit Biswas, thank you very much. My pleasure. As one of the world's most populous and rapidly developing nations, China faces a complex and pressing challenge in managing its limited water resources. As demand surges and supply dwindles, what can the country do to tackle the crisis? Well, joining me now is Chang Hua Wu, Vice Chair of the Governing Council of Asia Pacific Water Forum. Thanks for coming on the agenda. Now, China is drier than we think, with some provinces drier than parts of the Middle East. Does China have enough water to develop? China doesn't have enough fresh water uh, to really meet the planned growth agenda. And uh, so that has been a major challenge, uh, really getting everyone started to rethink about uh, transforming or transitioning our growth strategy, particularly in that process, to make sure we put water security at the core of the national strategy when we plan uh, you know, the land use, when we plan where to get people settled down, where to build a city, uh, where to build industrial parks or agricultural land, you name it. Uh, so that has been a major part of thinking at the national decision-making process. But then in reality, with all the complexity, as well as the challenging, particularly from the climate change, somehow it's really overwhelming everyone in that process. So how do we make sure we'll be able to better equip with, with the enough re resilience to the global challenges while we really can maintain our water security to meet the demand of uh, fresh water in particular from all walks of life? You talk about the problem as being quite overwhelming, um, but are there any tweaks that are already happening to China's economic growth model so that it is less water intensive, so that it is less polluting? Well, I think you know, this is not a new, it's not a new challenge. Uh, so if you look at the water security issues, there were three major dimensions of the challenges, not only in China, but shared in Asia Pacific region, as well as around the world. One is a too much, the second one is a too little, and the third one is a too dirty. So those are the three challenges that, you know, governments at the country level, at the regional level, uh, of course, at the global level, everyone is trying to address that and uh, to make sure uh, water security will be uh, enhanced the strong, you know, better or stronger uh, by addressing those challenges there. Water pollution continues to be a major part of the challenge in China. So if you look at the China's laws, regulations, the national action plans, particularly around the, four, you know, the five year planning cycles there, water pollution uh, has been a major, a top priority there. So every five years we set targets, particularly around how to reduce uh, you know, pollution, reduce the intensity of pollution, and to reduce the use of water, to so save water. Um, let's talk about China's record in raising green finance. I mean, I wonder how that is helping here. Well, financing is the key, or literally holds the key, uh, you know, to drive through the actions there. From the water perspective, it's more about financing in sustainable, uh, you know, water asset there. 
uh, currently, uh, pretty much that's not just one specific sector. I think in the agriculture sector, in the industrial sector, as well as in the power sector there as well, as long as there is a water asset there, we could potentially actually direct the finance to make sure we invest in solutions or asset that could really help reduce or relax, uh, hopefully somehow, uh, you know, really uh, redress, uh, address the water security or insecurity uh, challenges there. Uh, so green finance, from a green finance perspective, China, for instance, has been a global leader in terms of green bonds. And uh, green bond has been really playing a big role in terms of green or sustainable infrastructure financing there. As we all know, and uh, you know, in, in order to manage water in a sustainable manner, we do need a lot of infrastructure to be uh, sort of built, to be invested in. Uh, some examples that could be potentially controversial, we'll see. But at this moment, for, for instance, China has decided to connect all the uh, flows uh, of the you know, water system there, canals, rivers, lakes, you name it, uh, you know, literally building a nationwide water networks there. In order to do so, that requires tremendous amount of finance and uh, to build, to invest in those infra infrastructure. Now, uh, maybe short term, we'll be able to manage to help relax or reduce the pressure uh, of those you know, challenges there. But in the longer run, I think in the longer run, I think we still need to think harder in terms of understanding what that means for the longer term, uh, in terms of human intervention of the water flow uh, on this mm -hmm. planet Earth, whether those infrastructures invested by green, we call it green finance for now, uh, will be really lasting, you know, for a longer period of time. I think there are still a lot of questions mm -hmm. on the table that require experts to address. And how is China maybe looking beyond those um, water efficiencies and incorporating waternomics into agricultural planning, into industrial planning? Well, from policy perspective, pricing, uh, pricing water, valuing water has been a major policy instrument there. And uh, so there are a few dimensions actually into that picture. One, we control, uh, we control the total load of water use uh, from industrial uh, you know, use or urban use, different uses there. And uh, from Asia Pacific region, actually, they were academically, intellectually, there were five dimensions we've been looking, we've been deploying in Asia Pacific regions actually to look at uh, the water, you know, the policy part. We look at the environmental water, rural water, urban water, uh, environmental water, as well as natural disasters there. So that now we have a better capability knowledge to manage the water systems there so that when we deploy policies and legislations or standards there, we'll be able to put our hands around those issues and to make sure we really target the challenges in real life in the meantime to ensure uh, the, the effectiveness of policy tools and instruments there. Uh, so quota uh, has been uh, sort of uh, practiced in reality for decades in China. Because as I said in the beginning, China has been a uh, you know water scarce nation. It's not just a now. Historically, that has been the case. It's more challenging these days. So I had to make sure we really sort of uh, manage the use of water. In the meantime, as I said, we had to really halt. Uh, the damage, the loss of nature, you know, water in that process. Pollution has to be controlled, prevented as quickly, as effectively as possible, because we all know, uh, you know, pollution has been a major factor impacting the water scarcity, exacerbating water scarcity in yeah. China as well. Chen Huahu, thank you very much. Thank you. We've looked at some of the challenges. Let's shift our focus now to solutions. What innovative avenues can technology open to alleviating the water crisis? Well, joining me now is Dr. Peter Glick, a senior fellow and co-founder of the Pacific Institute. Thanks for coming on the agenda. Um, I want to start by asking you how the water industry has been embracing technology for sustainable water management. Uh, we're looking toward identifying new sources of supply that don't require taking more water out of ecosystems, things like treating and reusing wastewater. We can treat wastewater to incredibly high standards with modern technology. And places like Singapore and Israel and parts of California are moving in that direction. Uh, we also know, though, that technology is useful for 
improving the efficiency with which we use water. We can grow more food with less water, with better irrigation systems. You know, we can use more efficient dishwashers and washing machines and toilets to do the things in our homes that we want to use. So technology has a role on the demand side yeah. as well. And we're also learning how to restore natural ecosystems. And that requires rethinking the way we use water technology, taking down bad, damaging old dams. There are a whole series of possibilities for new strategies to solve our water challenges. I wonder how much of this is new and, and which innovations that you're seeing in practice that, that you're already excited by. You mentioned Israel, California, Singapore. Are there any particular projects that are making you think, right, this is the future? Well, so interestingly, some of the best advances we've had are not really new, but they haven't been taken up to a large degree. Uh, so it's existing technology, it's existing economic systems, it's better institutions, but it needs to be done more widely around the world. A, a good example is Singapore, which several years ago has moved to a much more aggressive effort to collect all of its wastewater, to treat that wastewater to an incredibly high standard, and then to put it back to use in industry, in agriculture, in drinking water. Uh, that's, those are technologies that we know how to use that we're using, for example, on the International Space Station to recycle all of the water that they use, but they could be used much more widely around the world. How do you think then AI might be used effectively? I mean, are we talking about, you know, detecting water links or do you think there, there are more possibilities and opportunities there? Well, so AI may offer possibilities. Of course, we're at the very beginning stages of understanding both the best uses of AI and the best applications, uh, how to make sure that it's safe. Uh, but the reality is a lot of the advances to move to a more sustainable future for water uh, don't require new technology, but require maybe better institutions. So another example is we know that water and energy are very closely connected. It takes a lot of energy to treat, collect, and use the water that we use. It takes a lot of water to produce and use energy in traditional energy systems like fossil fuel power plants and nuclear power plants. But renewable energy requires much less water per unit of energy that it produces. That's a real potential advance. And we can use less energy to treat and use the water that we use now, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that can help reduce some of the challenges associated with climate change. So better institutional management to combine thinking around water, energy, climate, and food together uh, are also really necessary to solve a lot of these challenges. Is all of this just ideas at this stage, or are you seeing some of that in practice? We talked about you know, renewable energy sources and incorporating them into the um, water industry. Where is that already happening with success? So the good news is that there are successful examples of all of these things happening in some places at some times, and the challenge is scaling them up and expanding them. So again, Singapore and Israel are currently collecting and treating and reusing 80 or 90 or even more percentages of their wastewater. We have more and more desalination plants being built uh, in the Middle East and in Israel and in Singapore. Uh, and maybe uh, even in the Western United States to, to turn salt water into drinking water. Uh, we know that some farmers are already growing more food with less water, but that needs to be expanded. The access to the technology and the knowledge about how to do that needs to be expanded worldwide. We're becoming more efficient in our use of water. Uh, per capita water use actually in the United States is going down, not up. That means we're using less water per person to do the things that we want, even though our populations are growing and our economies are growing. So the challenge is identifying the technologies and institutions that make sense and expanding them as fast as we can. And what about the Internet of Things there? I mean, how can that be um, scaled up from um, small things, everyday things in our homes to industry, for example? Yes, yeah, so we are learning even in our own homes, how to use things more carefully and more efficiently. We're beginning to uh, implement meters in individual homes so people can understand what water they're using and when they're using it. And so water utilities can understand when there might be a water leak uh, that previously went undetected that wastes 
millions and millions of cubic meters of water, they can now identify those leaks and they can go and fix them. So the internet of things, the ability to expand remote sensing about water is really important. Uh, there's information now being gathered from satellites about groundwater overuse worldwide, how to bring groundwater use back into balance. Uh, all of these technologies really offer some hope uh, that we can solve some of the crises that face us and move to what I call a sustainable third age of water. You talk about scaling up and you're mentioning satellites and space and I'm just seeing dollar signs. I mean, financial constraints are a big obstacle, aren't they, when it, when it comes to finding new solutions, using innovations um, and solving global water problems. I mean, what do you think needs to happen in terms of financial innovation? So actually, I think the good news is that these kinds of investments are actually far more productive. They reduce the costs in human health, for example. They reduce the costs of having to build energy systems bigger than we need to build them otherwise to provide for our water. So investments in water infrastructure and upgrading our water infrastructure and investments in technology actually return far more than they cost us. The challenge is financing. Uh, many, many parts of the world still have extensive water poverty. We don't have access to safe water and sanitation for billions of people worldwide. And they pay in bad health. They pay an hour spent by women and girls having to collect water from distant polluted sources rather than go to school. Investments in those communities pay off far more than the costs to us. And I think those Figuring out how to get those investments made is, is going to be very important. So how can decision makers and, and businesses make more water-wise investments? So part of it is the way we finance our water infrastructure. Uh, part of it, you, you make a good point, uh, corporations have a very important role to play, play here. The, the private sector uses a tremendous amount of water uh, they're responsible for all sorts of water technology and water industry. And the whole field of what we call water corporate stewardship, where corporations are using water much more wisely or thinking about their own water use or expanding investments in the water space, is an important step forward as well. There's a major effort at the United Nations now through something called the United Nations CEO Water Mandate to get those smart corporations who understand the role of corporate water stewardship to be more engaged with other companies that haven't yet figured out their responsibilities in this space. So the private sector is important. The banking sector is important. Uh, public investment from, from governments and aid agencies is important. There are a whole set of economic strategies that can play a role here. Dr. Peter Glick, thank you very much. My pleasure. Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find more agenda content on CGTN Europe's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube channels. Until next time, goodbye. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world, can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve? Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge, and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.